Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. If you're interested in Tesla, don't miss Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast hosted every week by me, Ryan McCaffrey, a longtime Tesla owner and super fan. On episode 200, I had Elon Musk on for an hour. On episode 220, I talked to Tesla's chief designer, and I'm also there at every big Tesla event covering it in person. Ride the Lightning recaps and analyzes everything happening with the world's biggest EV automaker each week. Hear about the latest Cybertruck developments, the next-gen Roadster, the Model S Plaid, plus the newest updates to the Model 3, X, Y, and more. New episodes have been dropping every Sunday since 2015, so jump in and enjoy. Listen for free on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast service, or check it out at patreon.com slash Podcast. That's Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. J.B. Weld, today's podcast brought to you by J.B. Weld, world's strongest bond. The brand DIYers and pros have trusted for over 50 years. you got to keep it in your cupboard, your toolbox, your garage. Available at jbweld.com, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, wherever you find finer products. Proudly made in the U.S. of A. Well, in this episode, we talk to legendary announcer and driver and friend of the show, Justin Bell. We'll also get into Cadillac and yeah, what, the they're, what they're up wing. to and uh, mm-hmm. talk a little rally racing, a lot of Le Mans, some um, Trans Am news as well. First, there's Geico. Would you love to save some money on your insurance? Of course you would. And who doesn't love a deal when it comes to great rates on insurance for everything? Geico can help. Insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, RV, even your homeowners, condo, or renter's insurance. They are all covered with GEICO. Save even more with special discounts when you bundle coverages together. Plus, they have an easy-to-use GEICO mobile app and 24-7 roadside assistance. So it's easy to switch to GEICO. It's a no-brainer. Switch today and see just how much you could save at GEICO.com. Go there and get a rate quote, or contact a local agent. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice. We've got a mandate. Get it on. Welcome to CarCast, Madam Coral. It's Matt, the moderator, DeAndrea, over there. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. We've got... uh got a big lineup of some fun cars to be driving over the next month or so and uh you know kicked it off with this cadillac ct4 v series black wing so it's a lot of it's a big name i know i can't you know black it's funny there's like black label whiskey and black that mercedes has the black version of of things Remember yeah, they, yeah yeah you know and it, and it you know i i you know, lincoln is a Black label? Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's why I was yeah. I was confused. Like when I was trying to get my Lincoln, I was like, Lincoln black, black label, not in black, just the black Yeah. And then isn't black label, I kept thinking, isn't that scotch? Um but it's interesting in that I always look at the decade and I go, What is what is the buzzword of that decade? You know? Like in the nineties it was stealth. It was oh, like, yeah. oh, okay. it'd, be, yeah, yeah. it'd be stealth cars and stealth aftershave, and stealth <laughs> movies. Like, we just stealth aftershave. Is that just water? <laughs> we just, yeah, we like the idea of stealth. Yeah. You know, it was hot. And then uh, right before stealth, there was turbo. Yeah. Everything was turbo. And then be, be cars be turbo, turbo they were big letters, yeah. you know, turbo, you know, on I the even side. Like shavers were turbo. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, every, you know, every the Gillette turbo. Every, I was like, eh. Cologne aftershave. <laughs> uh huh cars deodorant you know it's just like turbo. turbo and then there's a lot of like turbocharge your day with this cereal <laughs> you know so we're but yeah. now we're into black yeah that's the we we pick words and we go oh yeah and then we go with those words right and you know before turbo it was all rocket jet and you green know. right because we were when we're starting to dabble with fuel efficiency and getting into EV and hybrids it was green 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 mm-hmm. but now we're we're just saying EV and we're saying hybrid I, green's not even coming up anymore right right you know right so <laughs> uh, I just like when we grab a buzzword and it it's not one company you know Lincoln Mercedes. Yeah. Um, Cadillac, you know, yeah, I mean Lincoln yeah. and Cadillac, but but they're all 
It's all black. Yeah. Well, this car is badass. Really? <laughs> I don't care what it's called. So the the CT4, so the lineup is, and I was trying to get this in an order of sort of uh, kind of a fun scale and practical scale. So I've got the CT4 Blackwing, and then I'm going to drive the new Corvette, and then the new Cadillac Escalade, because it's got some road trips, and Grand Prix of Long Beach, and then the CT5 Blackwing, which is the slightly bigger version. So the CT4 is kind of the three series-ish, mm-hmm. you know, and then the CT5 is the larger kind of five series-ish. And, you know, we, <laughs> we've we talked about sort of the last hurrah of good gas engine vehicles, something fun you can get before you start getting into all EV stuff. And not that those cars won't perform. The performance numbers are there. But the uh, the CT4, it's a 3.6 liter turbocharged uh, V6. I want to say it's four. Let me get the exact spec. 472 horsepower, 445 pound feet of torque, manual transmission. Mm. And I know the automatic, the 10 speeds, probably a tenth or two quicker, but. The manual transmission well, not, just makes it the way it fun. you drive double clutch granny, <laughs> granny shift. Granny shifted. But you know, <laughs> if you had Vin Diesel behind the wheel of that well, right, thing, you'd probably right, right. shave a few tents. Yes, for sure. It is the game changer. It's it's kinda like the CTS V with when it had the manual and the V Wagon when it had the manual, like and those are starting to pull some money on bring a trailer. Oh and my stuff. god. You know, I'll see wagons like Cadillac wagons, sometimes even Mercedes. I always think about Mike August because he's dying to get a wagon. <laughs> oh, he, he, he's fa- he, he's never going to get a wagon, but he's always thinking about it, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, when you go to Europe with Mike, and you know, you go to Goodwood, he's always walking through the parking lot. Look at that wagon! Look at that wagon! Because yeah, in yeah, Europe, yeah. they have all these cool wagons, right. you know. But if he finds like a salvage title, something or other, he might pull the trigger on it. But it has to be something very unconventional how he acquires it. Well, <laughs> like you oh. know, when you see those caddy <laughs> wagons pop up on Bring a Trailer yeah. for seventy grand or or something, I I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I, I I'm trying to even think what years they are, but they're getting all the money. Yeah, they are. You know, years ago when I did that Spectre three four one challenge, and then there's the Magnum. Yes, the Magnum, which <laughs> I don't think ever had a manual. Money, no. uh, Amir Rosenbaum, who had Spectre at the time, he put on that event. He got a, a CTSV wagon. And he just like stripped all the interior out just to do the hill climb. It was just – it was like one seat and him. And uh, that thing was fast. I mean it was quick. You take all that weight out of it. Yeah. And it was just it was just sheet metal in that thing. But, you know, this car scoots around good. It's probably 0.60 in about four seconds. Starts at just under 60 grand. Uh, the one I'm driving is 70. I think you can get it even up closer to 90, but 70 seems pretty well equipped. Massage, seats, heated and cooled. You know, they've all got the magnetic ride now, so it's a really good balance. Like, you get into this thing, and it's super comfortable to drive, smooth, good feedback with the steering. Everything is good. Everything And, and then it hauls ass. Everything's fast. You know? I mean, you, everyone has an offering now. You know, it used to be... It, uh, well, there was a time back in, you know, 2000, 1999, and a guy like Dr. Drew wanted a little performance. It's, you know, he got the BMW M5. M5, yeah. And then I had the M3, you know. But, and it was, like, perfect. He had kids. I didn't, you know, he got the four-door. I got the two-door. But th- those were kind of the offerings back then. Mm-hmm. There was a couple of other cars that had some performance, but... You wanted a sedan yeah. that had some real real performance. He got his in a stick, by the way. Um, but he, he got an M5. Yeah. And, and that was kind of about it. Um, you know, uh, Jaguar and Cadillac and, and... There was probably like a Mercedes, like a Mercedes that, AMG. There was yeah, like, yeah. There, were, there was some... Like there an were, E-Class There AMG was some stuff out there, but it was pretty limited. It's not like, you know, Acura and... Um, you know, I'm trying I mean, to think. I mean, Audi maybe Lexus. had like an S4, but maybe not an RS4 then. Yeah, I'm trying to think what Audi. Had. Well, regardless, it's now on. Everyone's mm-hmm. got something, right? Because you know, again, we we talk about 
we wanting this stuff that when she threatened to take it away from us, we kind of really want it, you know. And mm-hmm. although we've got no problem with EV stuff, uh, yeah, this is just a cool car. And I, you know, I've got it. Everything's programmable now, so I've got it to where the exhaust is is configured to be a little loud all the time because I like the noise, and I got the gauges programmed to be sort of the Sport Plus kind of gauges, the V gauges. And uh, so, you know, they're kind of – the configuration has – it's a little bit more racy in the front, tells you what gear you're in Mm -hmm. and the RPM, and it's got uh, all the performance meters on it. Uh, But one of the meters that that is on there is I actually kind of like is – up in the upper right of the left corner, you can leave the tire pressure gauge up there. You don't have to – it doesn't have to wipe out the whole screen. It just shows you a little bit. It fits mm-hmm. it in there. Mm-hmm. And underneath it, it tells you cool, normal, or hot. Mm-hmm. So it tells you your tire temps mm-hmm. as well. So when you get in it, it just says cool. It doesn't tell you the actual temperature. Mm-hmm. And then after you drive it, you'll it'll switch. It'll just say normal. What? You know? What a time. It's just kind of a neat thing. Or like, oh, we're doing tire temperature now as well. I mean, maybe it's doing it based off of, I don't know, driving time or something. But it's got to be something in the sensor that's doing the tire pressure. It's got to be doing the temperature sensor as well. But the, the, I don't know, it's just kind of neat to know when your tires are warm. <laughs> the tire pressure is a good the, – the, the the gauge, the meters or whatever, it's it's – it's good. It's it's a good and a bad thing. You know, Joe Coy pulled up in his Ferrari. I saw the pictures of that. I can't remember. Good for it's, him. It's the new one. Good for him. Uh, one uh, of the new ones. The but I Portofino? Can't Is it the convertible uh, hardtop? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a California for a second. I was like, oh, boy. Well, it's the... This is the successor to that. So, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I had to slow... Him. I had to, I bit my <laughs> tongue for a second. Then I was like, oh. Yeah. Um, but... Um, you know, he came in, he was like, uh, the, the tire pressure gauge, do you have a tire pressure gauge? Do you have a hose? I Comedians are the best. That's why I yell at my family every 10 seconds. I, w- I went down to the garage the other night. I put Sonny's bike back together, put mm-hmm. the tires back on, filled them with the compressor. And I'm like, you don't get it. You don't get what other comedians do. <laughs> They're completely worthless. They know nothing. He just got out of the car. He's like, I, but the gay, the, the lights on, on the dash. Yeah. So we went over to the other shop and got the gauge and I think Gary threw it on there and it, it was all within a pound and a half of one another, you know, all four corners. And it's like that gauge pops on a lot. It freaks people out. And sometimes it means something, and Mm -hmm. a lot of times it doesn't mean anything. It's just on. So the light comes on, and it tells you if you're low on pressure, but there's often something in the, you know, in the configuration where you can see what the pressure numbers are. Well, I think the other, the the problem is, and maybe it's all our fault, but when Joe Coy sees he's got 37 pounds on the driver's side front, that doesn't mean anything to him. Right, but what if, I mean, look, he's a smart guy. What if he saw the four corners and it said 38, 38, 38, 28? Yeah, that'll right? mean, that'll mean like... something. No, that'll mean something. <laughs> it, we need a baseline, though. We need, here's what you want to be. Yeah. yeah, right. Like, maybe maybe some of the configuration should be, you know, sort of like a grayed out numbers. Like, the range is, you know, 34 to 40, depending on the temperature. And, you know... If it if you're in that range, it would you know it would show or or different color, right? If it yeah. said, you know, if it's a yellow was all the the numbers, but if it dropped below, the number would turn red. So mm-hmm. it didn't really matter what the number was. He would see thirty, and it would be a red number. He'd be like, oh, well, red probably means bad. <laughs> uh, Justin Bell's going <laughs> to join us in a second. He's uh, here now, so we'll we'll bring him in. Of course, his dad, one Lamar. Oh, nothing. Five times. Eh. R- raced with his father in 92 and 95. What years did I do Le Mans with my dad? Was it? No, I, was I, there. Mean, I was 93, 94. Yeah. I think I missed him. <laughs> Me and Pop Scarola <laughs> racing Le Mans. <laughs> if I told my dad I was leaving for uh, France to race Le Mans, I'd go like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, there you go. And then he wouldn't remember when you got back. What have you been doing? Here's how life? much my dad knows about <laughs> me racing. He read in the newspaper that uh, NASCAR is like coming coming to fontana and he's like you in that race yeah and i was like sure just say yeah yes. dad i'm on the circuit 
That, uh, yeah. Wait, I thought you were banned from the circuit then, from that incident. Well, I, I killed that guy on the track <laughs> after you died in the car. But yeah, we're going. Yeah, then we, we got to leave for Talladega tonight. <laughs> I mean, after the race. Yeah. It's right after the weekend, we got to pack up the semi. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the circuit. <laughs> Dad, there's something called professional race car driving. Yeah. I do a podcast. I'm a comedian who sometimes does a race. I don't know if, if I'm somebody, involved with that. If somebody, you know, came over, if a cable guy came over, let's assume he had cable. If a mm-hmm. cable guy came over mm-hmm. and he said, oh, that's a picture of your son? And he said, yeah, what does he do? What do you think he would say? Race car driver? Comedian? I, he'd podcaster? say he does a pod cart or something. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Bell is here. We were just <laughs> comparing and contrasting your father and my father as it pertains to uh, automobile racing. When well, hello guys. Hey, how are you? How are you? <laughs> yeah, good. Do you know it's funny? I, I kind of heard that, and I didn't know he was who he was until I got beaten up at school. You know, what I mean, because isn't everyone's dad a race car driver? You know, you just you just grow up, and <laughs> we're here to tell you now. No. Uh, well, do you know what? It's it shows how you can have your head stuck in in your ass because I growing up, I literally it was a kid at my little prep school who said, "Oh, you do it, Bill, son." And next thing is, I was lying on my back. Really? Yeah, because. Kids, especially British kids, you know, we hate, we love to build people up and then take them down. That's yes. the British thing, right? It, <laughs> right? It's what we do instantly. Nigel Mansell, oh my God, he was just the best. And then, we, the, the, you know, the Daily Mail slaughtered him for the next 10 years. And right. It's kind of a British thing. But I remember talking to Chloe Mason, you know, Nick's daughter, and I, I had a, I'm sure she won't like this being said on air, but we had a little thing back in the day when mm-hmm. we were teenagers shortly. Pink, Pink Floyd. Pink Nick, Floyd, Nick, Nick Mason. Mason. And right. She had never been to anything other than Wembley, you know, to mm-hmm. watch in front of 50,000 people. She'd never been to a pub and watched her dad play a gig, you know right, what I mean? Right. So, so I guess the moral of the story is, is that if, you, if you're born in, you know, to someone, you only know your dad when he's successful. If you become successful, you didn't know the journey up there, you know? So. Did you uh, go to Le Mans? Uh, I mean, I know you raced with your dad at Le Mans. Did yeah. you go there as a fan and watch him? The first time I went, I was four months. Uh, when and then, so I don't remember that. But I went. I've been to Le Mans about thirty-eight times out of really four years. Yeah, I raced there twelve times. Um, won it and all that stuff once. But um, then I went to see. Uh, but there was a period in my late teens when I kind of went with friends as a fan, and it was mm-hmm. it was a whole different. Well, oh my god, people getting drunk over here <laughs> in all the places. My mum had tried to stop me being exposed to because they used to in the good old days have a fair. And a good old fairground with mm-hmm. prostitutes and the world's fattest lady and, you know, yeah. a three-legged uh, small person. Um, yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you, you see the old Lamar footage and you can see the Ferris wheel in the background. Oh, it, was and- as, it, was as, it was like Mad Max over there. And my mom would take us for a walk and my sister and I, you know, would be 12 going, let's go in there. I want to see the fattest lady in the world again. And she'd be like, we're not doing that. <laughs> Meanwhile, they were, but uh, then they cleaned the whole place up by the time I was unfortunately but They older. tried to do it to the ring. Right, they try to do it at the Nurburgring with fair and a whole thing, and it's just a it's just a ghost town, right? Yeah, I mean, if you take the I don't know if you take the sleaze out of the sleazy area, it suddenly takes a lot out of it, doesn't it? You know, it's like re- reduces the appeal. Sebring, I mean, Sebring still, you know, in the old good old days, they'd burn cars in the middle. You know, now they have a police station with like a sixty foot crow's nest above <laughs> everybody. But everyone's still doing everything they want to, just out of sight. I mean, it's a, it's a fun fun thing. What were you driving when you won the Viper? Oh, the uh, Viper. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So, 1995 was in the Harrods McLaren with Dad. You know, we led for 12 hours on Father's Day, really, and, and then uh, came third um, mm-hmm. behind the JJ Leto car, and that was a that was a obviously extraordinary to be up there on the podium with my dad, and and I mean you'd have appreciate this adam because you know obviously it happens to you when you go to starbucks but i've never had a hundred thousand people on the podium we stood up there and hundred thousand people down below and seventy thousand brits all shouting i mean i heard bell i mean they were saying Derek bell but you know it was right. like bell i'm like <laughs> it's yes. close enough <laughs> and and it's close enough and and dad's and dad said just you know soak it in so i went to the front put my hands on the railing and, and remember going god to to be a dictator. Now I get it. Now I right. know there's an appeal to this sort of yeah. massive humanity. And and then when I went 
back three years later when when we won it in the Viper, which was just you know kick-ass program really, and uh, we won everything for four years. And and being up there having won your class was was great, but not as good as as finishing third with dad. Was the first time you you did Lamar with your dad? Was that the first time? Nineteen ninety two. It yeah. was the first time I did it in the 962 Porsche. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah, in the pouring rain. Um, mm. When I, you know, the difference between being young and stupid and old and stupid, maybe. Mm-hmm. Dad says it's raining, it's horrific out there. And I came in and went, that was brilliant. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so um, much fun. So much fun. But yeah, that was the end of that 962 era. You know, it was like the last run probably for one of those cars. But yeah, I was going to say, in the end of the, end of the early 90s. Yeah. But pulling out of the pit lane. At a race where I'd watched it as a fan for 25 years was still the single most defining moment. You know, pulling out, going, oh, my God, here it is. Okay, there's the fair- fairground. You could smell the su- – you know, I used to say you could fel- smell the sweet smells of the fairground at night when you drove past. You could smell the campfires on the back. You could smell the marijuana, at, uh, you know, down into another part of the track through – Tert Rouge, and then you'd get the bright lights of the the pits. It's it's a very uh, special place. Yeah, a feast for the senses. I was there in, I'm going to say, see if I can try to figure this out. I was there in maybe 04. What place did you come in? 05. It was a torrential rainstorm. I think they shortened the race by an hour, and I think Aston Martin won yeah. the GT, GT class. class. Um, so it must have been 06 yeah. or something yeah. something like that. That was my, my recollection. I love those Aston Martins mm-hmm. in the British – I mean, in the they Aston Martin so racing good. green. They just – in the race trim, that's a proper GT car. It, it is, isn't it? But I don't know about you, but when I'm driving around here, if I see a, a Vantish or a Vanquish, or, you still go – that dude, he chose well. I mean, if I see one, I go. Yeah. That was a, that was a, a definite decision to buy that car. It's not just like you're buying a, a you know, BMW or right, something. Right, right. You go. That is a really interesting choice. Yeah. I yeah. just I just drove the Vantage. The the well, I don't think they call it a V8 Vantage anymore. It's just the Vantage, and then they have the 12 that's coming out that's already sold. And it had the face lifted front, right? Mm-hmm. The optional note for like three thousand dollars, you can make it look like an Aston Martin yeah. again instead yeah. of the big, the yeah. big grouper mouth. And I was like, oh, this really looks good. Oh yeah, it really looks good. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you go to the Peterson and see that when they did the Bond exhibition and see all the Astons no. there? No, we should have done that. That was that was pretty cool to see the cars that they they had there. I mean, you realize why James Bond drives an Aston? Yeah, especially that DB5 there. <sighs> Where DB4. where is that? Yeah, is it a four or five? DB four, isn't it? The original, I yeah. guess. Where is that Viper that won Le Mans? Won the class at Le Mans? So the first, I know that we won the world championship the year before, which was the first championship for Chrysler. So I know that's in the Rensen. You know, it's in their museum in mm-hmm. Detroit. I think some some guy owns it. I, I drove it about ten years ago at Goodwood, and some French guy owns it. And you know where. There was a time, as we all know, when they're going, do you want to buy a race car? It's 50 grand. It's 25 grand. It's 100 grand. Now they're like, oh, it's 5 million. Yeah. You know, right. It's- I would imagine that car being, uh, I don't, I mean, the only Chrysler to win? or The I only Chrysler to win a world championship and the only Chrysler to win Le Mans. That's, I mean, that's what yeah. I was going to say. Now, the, you know, Chrysler doesn't have the provenance if, per se, but it, uh, what everyone's always looking for. It's always funny when you look on Bring a Trailer or Bruce Kenepa's website. Is it like oh, the, uh, only 47 of these uh, four GTs were in Wimbledon white? And you're like, they're always trying to get some. Yeah, and this yeah, is yeah. a radio delete. So they only made uh, they only made 18 yeah. of those. Like there was kind of <laughs> trying to whittle that number down right. to some sort of rarefied air. But, yeah, the only Viper and... <clears throat> Vipers have come on strong lately. I mean, yeah. they, ain't, they used to be able to pick those things up for thirty grand all day long, and not now. People people kind of knocked them. You know, they're gonna have fit and finish and blah blah. It's got a truck engine in it. You know, all that shit. But they ain't, they ain't cheap anymore. No, and I mean, I imagine whoever bought that <laughs> Lamar winning Viper, yeah. is pretty happy with their decision There's about a, now. There was a Viper on Bring a Trailer, the first gen, one of the handful of like the very first ones that were kind of hand built. I think it went up to like eighty or eighty three thousand on Bring a Trailer, and it was like no sale. And actually, the seller sounded like a little grumpy at the end. He's like, "Fine, I'll just, I'll just." 
you know, did the touch up paint. It'll be back. It's gonna be worth way more. <laughs> yeah. It was like, all right, eighty eighty three grand. Well, you know, they they made they made uh, uh, the year we won. It was all in the middle of that Chrysler Daimler Chrysler merger and everything. Right. And I thought I was gonna be racing for Mercedes the next year, so we we had this celebration dinner in Detroit, and uh, I actually. Can you imagine this? The entire board of Chrysler and all these people in the middle of the atrium there at the Ren Center. I was in the AC in in the Le Mans car down the corridor. I mean, I was in the car we won the championships like in November, and I had to drive down this corridor uh, towards the crowd and like da da get out. Rap! I started it up. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking noise! I I didn't realize <laughs> that when you light up cold race worn slicks on uh, on vinyl flooring yeah. you the the tires win so i kind of <laughs> gathered up like a cartoon all the vinyl tires and i'm sh- i'm just <laughs> rap, 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 and they're just trying to like making a silly noise for effect carbon brakes of course and oh. i go yeah. to hit them and i'm going i'm doing 20 miles an hour but i'm going i can't freaking stop this car and i've got like bob lutz and everyone there going this yeah. is great this is great like, this yeah. is about, i'm about Taking to make the out. main news by killing the, the you know taking out like pinballs the whole board <laughs> what were the restrictions in your class for that car engine wise uh, horsepower wise was it a, about an intake well you see we were we were in what was called at one point gt1 so mm-hmm. even a, a gt1 and then gt2 and i mean i think we were Probably running on the north side of 750 horsepower in that. We were doing 215 miles an hour down the straight wow. because it didn't have the downforce. Whereas, you know, it's funny with prototypes, you know, they, they go through the corner so much faster and then something as slippery as the Viper just started to go by them again, you know, right. down the straight. And this so. is a kind of an early Viper. So as the Viper went stuff. on. Yeah. They, what they did, as you met, was they. A bit like Porsche when they did the 959. You know what I mean? It, and then they had 20 years of 911s trying to catch up to the 959, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It was so ahead of its time. Our race car was so advanced, full carbon fiber, everything. You know, the, the road, it had no correlation to the road cars. You know, right. you, people say, oh, I hate, my, I hate a Viper. It's just a, a, you know, meathead's car. I'm like, well, our race car isn't. You know, it's, right. it's yeah. a full-blown Eureka prepared it. And the production cars, the GTS models, all yeah, catching all up to be up. what you yeah. drove 10 years ago, yeah. you know, 10 years earlier in the race. Yeah, it was funny. At that at that dinner, they go and say, oh, so uh, we're going to do 100 limited edition tribute cars to the GT2 World Championship. And they were in white with blue stripes, beautiful wing. And I'm very grandly and misguidedly went, I want number 52. I'll take it, you know, mm-hmm. thinking I was going to have that Mercedes contract. Uh, about nine months later, I get this fax. Says, Your order's ready if you could send us $68,000. And I'm going, I haven't got fucking $68,000, <laughs> so, but I need the car. So I went to Chrysler UK, who I have a contract with, and said, I've got a great idea. You buy the car. You import it. I'll give it to you for a certain number of days, and then it's mine. And they were like, the guy was such a race fan. He said, that's a great deal. Wow. <laughs> um, and then when I moved to America, I sold it. And uh, it's now back in the States. It's number 52, and I think it's worth some money. Is uh, Was that mm. car, as you raced it and raced trim, was that a tube frame car? It's tube frame, yes. So they allowed that in terms of... It was, the, it was a bit of a hybrid. It was, it was a bit like... It was a bit like a, it, like any of the GT3 or two cars now, it's a, it's a combination of, of it had a tub, a, a tub with the roll cage. But it's, I mean, you're talking 20 years ago now, aren't you? So yeah, but I, see, I would have wouldn't have thought they would let you go full tube. Frame. No, no, Phil. It wasn't like the Trans Am car that you might be driving soon. No. Right. Yeah. Are you going to go to that race? I'm hoping to. Yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I. I just told you doing the Trans Am thing. I mean, obviously Tommy, who's normally Tommy Kendall, who's normally you know always with me. He, um, I was talking to him the other day about that whole Trans Am era for me. Even though mm-hmm. I only did it for two years in the beginning of the two thousands, was the most fun racing I'd ever had. What did had. you drive? I drove the Derhard Corvette, mm. one Rookie of the Year, and all that oh. stuff. And then then we took it to Daytona. Shows how car that, fast those cars are. The uh, with Simon Gregg's, you know, funding it. Um, we went – Derhag built a purpose-built Trans Am car for Daytona, and it was the first year of the Grand Am, and I out-qualified the entire field by a second and a half. Really? We had – imagine we were running 800 and something horsepower. He just – massive brakes. Uh, they didn't let us stay in that place. We, we <laughs> went backwards. 
Oh, really? Yeah, but we call, I, call, I got, what do they call it? Not pole position, I got fastest lap. Did they want to add weight or anything to the car? Uh, yeah, they had a lot of weight because, you know, they were launching Daytona prototypes. So it was, you know, they didn't need this bright orange car that looked like it was from the 80s. Right. You know, stealing the show. But down that banking, can you imagine? 840 horsepower. Yeah. Something. Wow. It was the, 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 the ultimate Trans Am. I'm trying to think. And so what year was where you driving Trans Am? 2002. One and two. Uh, yeah. Is Corvette is not uh, with a mid-engine offering, not in the Trans Am series? Or no. Where are I, they? I think they're not... Well, the cars are all kind of the same underneath, tube frame and, and whatnot, and the engine. So they're, they retired that body, and they're running the Camaro bodies. Right. I think but, because the Corvette is now mid-engine, so what, they're, they're not going to run it. But why? I mean, would there be rules? I mean, what would prevent Chevy from saying, we're going we're gonna to enter a Camaro, and we're going to enter a Corvette, and the Corvette's mid-engine? I would imagine yeah. there's no real commercial benefit to them. Do, I mean, the days of Trans Am, when we all knew and loved it, it was l- the legitimate place, wasn't it, for an, a manufacturer to showcase what they did. Now, obviously, yeah. I don't, now it isn't. Now that I'm doing it. And now that you're doing shit. it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they, they ended the Corvette body because of that. They're saying, well, you know, running the front end, like running a C7 Corvette body in Trans Am doesn't do anything for us. Yeah, I know. I just I would love to see a full mm. Trans Am mid engine. Mid engine, yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be unfair. Uh, probably because I don't think there's anything else out there that's mid engine. But and maybe just expensive, like you're saying, you like do, oh, you gotta you gotta do all this aero and you gotta you see you seen the and, GT class or at least you see it now. You see Ferrari, you know. A couple of years ago, 488s, and they're running with the 911s. Yeah, Audi and nine, R8s. Lines and, 11, yeah. running with the front engine, yeah. uh, Aston Martins, you know. They, and, and it's the called Corvettes balance of performance. They've done mm-hmm. a good job. I mean, how can a McLaren run against a Mustang in the Michelin Pilot Challenge? If, they do, if you saw them in the parking lot, you'd say there's no way, right? And a Porsche. But, you know, IMSA have done a great job of balance of performance, even though everyone hates it. It either works for you or against you, right? right? It goes round and round. But they've managed to really equalize the cars. So, as you say, front engine, rear engine, and mid engine, all in the same race. They get there in a different way, but they make the same lap time. And is everything still rear wheel drive, or was there a minute where they ran all wheel drive? Like the Audi R8s, were they running rear wheel drive? I think they had drive? to run wheel, rear wheel drive. You know, that. I'll tell you one of the coolest, you know, back in the day cars was the. Uh, Trans Am Audi Quattros, remember those? Oh my God! Things. Yes. Well, so, they were they they were running. Yeah, they were running the Quattro, weren't they? That yeah, was, yeah, like uh, mid eighties, later eighties. Yeah. You know, early eighties. Great color scheme. Some great drivers. You know, just a weirdo car. Probably a straight five <laughs> with <laughs> the turbo on it and all wheel drive. I mean, yeah. everyone else is running a Roush Mustang or something. And they're up there with their straight five and their turbo and their all wheel drive. And it's just a it's a beast of car. Mm-hmm. And they hold ass. Yeah. And there's some of those are around. They pop up in yeah. the vintage races. Did you were you at Emilio when they had the um uh all those martini cars? Uh they had like a martini trailer and but I know, I was thinking of the they obviously they had the Lance here the, the but they had the whole display of those sort of 80s. Uh, uh, maybe a bunch of John 80s, Champions cars as well. Yeah, 80s yeah. Yeah. rally cars and things. And you look at it and you go, all right. That, yeah. that that still gives you a tingle in the right places. When you see a Quattro, you go, there, okay. You know, there's a Lancia or Lancia or whatever on Bring a Trailer, Chris, in, in, the, in the weird first. So there's a limited edition Martini Lancia. You know, ni- or whatever. Ni- no, like yeah. nineteen ninety three. You know, Lancia. I don't know if it's even a two door, four a two door, four door, whatever. But those weirdo early nineties, late eighties um, rally cars, but just street version. You know, like the Viper you were yeah. talking about. Uh, those things are 
two hundred and fifty grand oh, now, shoot. or two hundred and eleven there on that little Lancia Integrale. Look, yeah, Jeez. like it's it's a it's a pea shooter. You know, it didn't retail for that much. It, it wouldn't <laughs> impress the chicks if you pulled up no. in it. It's a, it kind of looks like a Golf GTI Volkswagen. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, there's not. There's not much to it. I'm sure it's fairly gutless, you know, and, and the interior, the interior would be very nineties or, or late eighties, you know. Uh, but there's a market for those things now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, I think part of the appeal is that you feel like Walter Roll or one of those guys, Yuha Kankanen or so, you feel that you're going to be going through the middle of the, uh, the Swiss Alps sideways. Yeah. You know, yeah. Thing, with a it's a cool little the car. That thing's kind of, yeah. that thing it, looks it, good. It's cool. It's a cool little car, but if you would have said to one of us or anybody else several years ago, what do you think this thing sells for? You'd go, it's, it's, a, it's probably in the 40 to yeah. four, uh-huh. mid forties, mid forties. Totally. You know, now it's two, it's over 200. Yeah. Crazy, it, right? It, it's a cool car, but you got to have to have a kind of special collection. Cause you're right. You don't, you don't tour your friends through the garage and go, yeah, it's this little thing costs 200 They didn't even notice it when they walked by. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I wonder what – imagine again what the what a race car with provenance is worth, you know, driven by one of the legends. That must be the, – the, the, rally, the rally segment has gone up a lot. Mm. Like it's sort of like F1 has gone up a lot. You brought up uh, Nige, Nigel Mansell. Uh, his – He's got a couple of F1 cars going across the blocks coming up. I think in the RM auctions, Chris. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's an estimate on them yet. But the, you know, the rally cars and the F1 cars just sort of, there wasn't a market for them a few few years ago. More modern F1 cars. Just, they were sort of in the, like, like, Drag drag car quarter mile cars and NASCARs really haven't caught on in terms of in terms of value vintage value. Indies are starting to starting to kind of catch mm-hmm. on a little bit, but they're still lagging behind. But for some reason, the rally segment just popped up. Well, I think maybe you know the, if you think about it, even with the Formula One cars, there's there's a break point in the technology that before that, you your guys at your garage, if you had a a 1990 Formula Ferrari Formula One. You could you could start it up and you could drive it around Willow Springs and you'd, you'd feel pretty cool. You get much long after that, and it takes if you don't have the module with the right laptop, you can't start anything. And right. yeah, yeah. So I think it's funny in the collector's eyes, they become paperweights at that point. You can't drive it. So I wonder. I wonder what that break point is. I think it's it's when the analog world kind of totally went from our motorsports and it's uh i mean i've driven old ex formula one cars and it's it's a blast but then you 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 worry about sometimes in the historic scene you know it's a gynecologist from you know ohio ohio who's driving you know, jackie stewart's six seater six wheel terrell and you go that was a handful then let right. alone mm-hmm. you know with him driving it so good Did- luck uh, speaking of F one, I was just watching or uh, rewatching the uh, Schumacher doc. I I can't figure out what shape. He, I know he's in bad shape, but I, I I have no reports on any progress or any sense of anything. Does anybody have any of that information? So he has like Jean Todd and certain people are very close to the family, and they obviously have seen him. Um, Occasionally, they'll drip out those news releases that he's you know, a little better or whatever. But a friend of mine who's a who's a surgeon, she said after you can't be on those coma meds for 20, 50, 10 years or whatever it is and, and have a brain left. But I uh, I have this vision of him, you know, when his son Mick's running at the Formula One. Right? Can you imagine down the end of a corridor in their house in the mountains in Switzerland? There's a corridor and a huge TV, and they just have it on so he can mm-hmm. listen to it. I mean, yeah. sure, that's what happens. Hear his name up there. Hear his and... name up there, but it's kind of macabre, really. Yeah. yeah. It, it's if it wasn't him, he wouldn't be alive, would he? I don't think. I mean, I don't know any women in my life that would have kept me on for life. Support. Oh, that's that. <laughs> would you? I mean, I don't <laughs> Are think. Are you kidding? Adam, I, that's, I was watching the doc and they got his wife. She's full of tears and she's like, we do everything. I do everything. I would have been. My ex-wife would have pushed me toward the tree. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, but your ex-wife and my ex-wife would have they'd, they'd have said, "Why did you pull the plug? He only he was only in for a hernia operation." But it was it was the end. Was, <laughs> Once was, you get to minute eighteen, it's just not worth. <laughs> that's right. Why put the family through the grief? Yeah. But I you know what to do? Awful. But you know what's crazy about that documentary? My girlfriend Melani, she doesn't. She's into cars, into Porsches in a big way, but she doesn't really know anything about Formula One until Drive to Survive. Certainly nothing about. Schumacher and she watched the documentary without me and said she didn't know till the last three minutes that he was still alive mm. you know I mean because she didn't know he was alive you know right. in yeah in general and it was like freaky to her right at the end they're like well you know hopefully we'll come back and you know she thought it was she thought, she thought it was a posthumous documentary uh-huh. yeah right you know the uh the uh, pod, by the way, or the show Life with Legends podcast and co-hosting with the dad, Derek Bell, uh, where you bring in the racing legends and they talk about famous moments in motorsports. Uh, I'm, I'm glad all of this is being captured because some of these guys that are a little bit older than us, you know, they're not young anymore. Mm-mm. And uh, you just spoke I, to I Parnelli? To capture their story, you know. Well, that's the whole point. Uh a couple of things. One is when I left here last time, I asked Matt how, what do you think about me doing a podcast? And his advice was absolutely not. Um, so thanks for that. I ignored you. Um, Good. But I, I did ignore you for the talk show. It was the wrong thing to do. But it all stems from talk about Le Mans. I'm sitting there at Le Mans with Dad and Jackie X Friday night at the Hotel de France. We're talking. They're talking. And I'm, I'm just listening going, these are amazing stories about from these two legendary drivers who won Four Le Mans together. And, oh God, I wish I could capture it. Then I'm sitting with Brian Redman, not when he's doing a big speech, you know, and telling the normal stories. I'm going, God, I, I should really get this. And then, of course, suddenly, ping, you get an email, so-and-so's died. Wow, you see on Twitter, someone else has mm-hmm. died. I'm thinking, I need to get on and do this. So it's a passion project, really, um, with probably limited commercial uh, benefit. But the one thing I realize is, you know, I love – I, I'm pretty good at interviewing people. They they share things with me, especially as I've done it, you know, so maybe not at their level. But, you know, Adam, that kind of intimacy that comes from having a – you and comedians can have a, a, a rapport that you don't with anyone else just because you've both been through the same thing. And I have access. So I'm kind of jumping on it because, mm-hmm. uh, as you mentioned, Parnelli, I mean, Parnelli, I, I hate to say it, but I'm sure I was the last – media that he will ever talk to you know and it was we didn't video it because i you know you don't want to make your heroes look frail and Mm -hmm. he did look frail but to hear him talk he's so smart and just to hear him talk about things um and i've done redman and 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 obviously hurley haywood and my dad was the first one and i've got mario lined up and emerson and i mean i'm obviously doing all those legends and then vic alford too late for that uh sadly um then when i go to europe for lamar i'll do Jackie X and, and, and Hans Stuck and people. And outside that, I'm doing people like yourself and just because people connected with speed, people that have a passion for it. Um, I did Patrick Long because he's a young legend. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm – you're right. If I don't capture it and it's it's much more of a conversation instead of, you know, in 1952, you know, when you led for seven laps. You know, I don't do that. I just talk. You know, is uh, someone who I may have gotten one of the last Dan Gurney interviews when we're interviewing him. I think for, it's the last filmed interview. Probably the last filmed yeah. interview. Um, you have it, and now it's it's good to be on record. But, you know, when you make a documentary, you, you grab from all these different sources, you know, like you do one on Carol Shelby, and it's – him from 1982 talking to a guy and you know the lighting's for shit and the sound isn't great and it's that you know that bad betamax shit but it's there it is and and we need it yeah you know what i mean and there's going to be some version of that with all these things that you've done as well that somebody somebody's going to do a parnelli jones uh and they're going to want to grab some of that yeah i i mean i think that's I mean, I know you guys, <clears throat> you have all your big shows and you do projects as well that just, you know, you know are good things to do. <clears throat> and uh, at worst, I'll have an amazing archive, as you say, of conversations of people that I admire. And it's been and it's been fun because, you know, I, 
I am doing it in person. I'm traveling to their home because I'm tying it in with my portrait photography, which I mm-hmm. love. I use Leica and I, you know, I'd like to do an exhibition sometime and, and all that. And it's, it's fun taking portraits of people away from the racetrack. And yeah. uh, I'm not a pro, but, you know, again, it's like an extension of the interviews. And, and like you said, the, the history there, um, you know, so many of these guys that you've known pretty much your whole life and then be able to sit down with a few that you maybe haven't met before yeah. and get that side of the story. It's fun. But I'm also, sure it's going to be fun. You know, also you have access and you're uniquely qualified because of your dad's experience, because of your experience and because of your ability to do conduct an interview and have a conversation with somebody that is cogent and interesting and fascinating to people. Like there's, there's not many people on the planet who are qualified because it's not just one element. It's not just I raced or I, I do a podcast or I broadcast or whatever it. And there's some, there's some familiar stuff, familial yeah. stuff like your dad in there and your dad has relationships. And so, I mean, your dad's the subject of one yeah, of them. Exactly. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a perfect storm. And uh, I think it's great that you're capturing thank all you. these guys' voices. Yeah, I, I mean, it's thank you so much for saying that. It is. It's funny. I we've all been through it when uh, when you get interviewed by someone that really sh- has no place interviewing anybody. And um, <laughs> I remember asking Chris Economaki. So this is 15 years ago. I wow. was driving him down to the original voice, you know, of motorsports. Sure. Here, and he had his voice like this, and I was, I, I said, Chris. Uh, Listen, I really want to try and do more TV and and interview people and things. What what's your advice? And he was I was driving him and a great friend of his called Edgar Otto to the Homestead race. They'd known each other. They as they said, the last two people alive that knew each other as children, and it was great. So I'm driving them there, and I asked Chris, and he goes, "For God's sake, just listen." He said, "These people come in with twenty questions, and it's like, you know, what color bike did you ride? Anyway, how was high school? What did you eat for dinner?" He said, "They just bounce around." He said, "Just listen; it all comes right. You know what I mean?" Yeah. It's uh, and so it's it's been really fun. But I wish I was a trust fund kid so I could just travel the world and interview my heroes. Instead, I have to like go. Oh, I'm going to the East Coast. Let's let's try and get four of them in. People with those experiences have such stories. And oh. uh, when we did the Newman doc, Nate and I went up and talked to. Uh, uh, Pixar, John Lasseter. Oh, and, right. Oh, yeah. And just as an example of a storyteller, we went in, we set up the cameras, and Nate said, All right, so, you know, it's documentary, it's Paul Newman. And he's like, Yeah, okay. He talked for two hours, and we didn't ask a single question. <laughs> yeah. And then at one point, Nate's like, I'm so sorry. The battery's dead. I got to replace the battery. Like, that yeah. was his big crushing moment. Yeah, like, isn't it funny? we didn't ask a single question. He just put it all out there, and it was amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, was, let me just hit a spot here. JB Weld, world's strongest bond, the brand DIYers and pros have trusted for over 50 years. Epoxies, super glues, sticks, and uh, you can use it on big and small. Projects, practically any surface, metal, wood, plastic, glass, ceramics. Keep it in your kitchen. Uh, put it in the kitchen drawer there with the batteries. Toolbox or your uh, supplies out in the garage. Also, the proud owner of Herculiner, the original DIY truck bed liner. If you're looking for the world's strongest truck bed liner, Herculiner has you covered. And it's available at jbweld.com, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, AutoZone, Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly, Amazon, Michaels, and more. And it's proudly made in the U.S. of A. I've been using JB Weld products pretty much my whole fix-it career, and now they make everything. So jbweld.com, made in the U.S. of A. Uh, Justin, always good to uh, pay a visit with you. Thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, I agree. So where's Tommy? Is he? Uh, so, I don't so know. Tommy, he come in anymore. Yeah, so he's, <laughs> he's, he's too big. No, I'll tell you what actually happened. Is we, he going down to the TA race? I'm sure he probably will. Yeah, I will mean, he be working? No. So he, remember, we had the talk show. We still have the talk show. Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, Michelin uh, went in a different direction this mm-hmm. year with their sponsorship. Uh, just economics um so we couldn't make it to the imsa races this year after three amazing seasons but you know as talk media we host pebble beach you know it's not mm-hmm. cbs it's not fox it's not nbc it's us mm-hmm. um looks like we'll be working with the guys at chattanooga if you've never been to that festival it's probably the nicest one i've ever been to uh, i'll get you an invite yeah um, tennessee or? tennessee it's okay. just what a great people car collections and great people just like 
like you imagine Amelia when when Bill started it right. 25 mm-hmm. years ago. Um, and uh, we're doing or drain, we're involved with your drain guys again in Newport. So it's kind of on the big business side of things with our live stream, we're doing well. Uh, but we're we're launching a, a new EV show, um, two ex race car drivers that you know don't know anything about it and it's going to go on pbs oh great it's called electric yeah. talk and it's it's you know tommy used to have test drive you know which was usually yeah, sure. i used to have shut up and drive and it's it's you know it's uh, it's going to be pretty cool so we're in pre-production on that so um, uh so will will we see you up at laguna seca in a yeah so we will be there just okay. but just as ourselves just okay. doing some stuff and then of course we have all the it's a summer of fun everybody's released from their dungeon. Yeah, no, it's good, good to, to go, go out and, and just walk around the track and yeah. see some racing and can't wait. And uh catch up with everybody that we've missed for the past. Right. Years. You want to see me? I'll be in Indianapolis or you can go to Laguna Seca on the week of the twenty second of April. Come say hi. But I'll be at Helium Comedy Club May sixth and seventh and go to AdamCroll.com for all the live shows. What do you got, man? I uh, just uh, like we said, the cars that we're driving. You want to see them? Follow me at Moderator on social media. Oh, Life with Legends is on Patreon, by the way. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I hey. put it. So it's on Patreon because I decided, you know, uh, after your advice, don't try and do a podcast. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go behind a paywall, and even if there's a thousand people, there's <laughs> got to be a thousand people. I'm at 36 right now, but counting. Sweet. All right. So patreoncom slash legends. And until next time, it's Adam Kroll for Justin Bell and Matt, the Moderator, DeAndre saying, "Keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel." For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. Would you love to save some money on your insurance? Of course you would. And who doesn't love a deal? When it comes to great rates on insurance for everything, GEICO can help. Insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, RV, even your homeowners, condo, or renter's insurance. They are all covered with GEICO. Save even more with special discounts when you bundle coverages together. Plus, they have an easy-to-use GEICO mobile app. And 24-7 roadside assistance, so it's easy to switch to GEICO. It's a no-brainer. Switch today and see just how much you could save at GEICO.com. Go there and get a rate quote or contact a local agent. This February on Pluto TV, we're putting the spotlight on iconic black talent. Watch your favorite movies like Top 5, 48 Hours, and More Than a Game. And drop in to binge black TV classics like The Bernie Mac Show and Moesha. Pluto TV has hundreds of channels and thousands more movies and TV shows all for free. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start watching today. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free.